you've got big dreams and bad genes, you are in the right place. These shirts are live at barbellapparel.com. Link is in the description. Now let's talk about glutes. Glute activation is a controversial topic and everyone seems to have an opinion about it. Claims about it range from it being the magic sauce to fix dysfunction and increase performance to it being a complete distraction and waste of time. So we're going to pick it apart and answer. Do glute activation techniques increase athletic performance? Will it help you with your squat or deadlift? Is glute amnesia completely made up and do you just need to stop being a baby and get under the bar? Let's start with the studies. Brett Contreras, universally known as The Glute Guy, did a really excellent video summarizing his views on low load activation or the techniques you normally think of as people using to start off their workouts, doing things like clamshells and kickbacks with bands and monster walks. And the whole idea behind this is to bring the glutes online to help facilitate immediate improvements in performance. This is the type of stuff that leads people to believe that they just won't squat as much or jump as high if they don't start their workouts with 25 minutes of glute focused banded work. And this is where a lot of the criticism of the techniques come from. In Brett's video, he cited 11 studies with mixed results between them, some showing pretty substantial improvements in performance and some not so much. In the four camp, Fisher et al. did a study in 2017 that showed greater excitability in the motor cortex region of the brain responsible for glute contraction by having the participants in the study do banded low load glute activation for 20 minutes, three times per day for a week. Now, this might seem to have really exciting implications. You're actually changing how the brain operates to get greater glute activation, but it does beg the question of how this would track against more standard generic weight training protocols that just progressively load hip extension over time. Another study by Guillardo Izquierdo in 2020 showed significant increase in vertical jump after eight weeks compared to the control. However, several other studies showed no significant improvements at all in hip extension force or running or jumping. And then there was an interesting result that came from PAR in 2017 where a hang high pull was tested and the glute activation group actually saw less glute activation while doing the high pulls while still showing the desired effect of more force output overall. So it was posited that the activation exercises led to more efficient recruitment, which doesn't necessarily require more total output from the glutes to get a net better result. Now that explanation has a sort of logical sense to it, but that's not exactly a tree branch that I would hang a swing from. For inquiry into subjects like these, where we mostly know how things work, but are far from a complete theory of it, more research is needed is the only firm conclusion we can really pull out of it. This is also where I have less interest in glute activation as a technique, as these studies were more concerned with the generic effect of glute activation exercises over everyone and weren't really focused on individual use cases for people facing specific problems. What's of more interest to me is if there is ever a scenario where these type of protocols can actually help somebody like a lifter, an athlete, or a patient who has room to get a better return from their training or rehab by implementing these movements. To do that, we need some more precise definitions. The premise of activation started with physician Vlad Yanda, who proposed that weak glutes were implicated in injury. And that was followed up by work by Dr. Stu McGill, the famous spinal expert, in his investigation into low back pain and injury. The proposed mechanisms for this are based around the idea of reciprocal inhibition. It's basically that when one muscle stretches, the other has to relax, and that's the only way that you can move fluidly and effectively. So essentially, when you're trying to squeeze your bicep to flex your elbow, you're not going to be able to do that if you're also squeezing your tricep. Now, if for whatever reason, your tricep was stiff, inflamed, or otherwise limited, your body might register that as a contraction and it might impact your ability to effectively contract your bicep, regardless of the bicep's health or its actual ability to contract. A similar dynamic exists between the glutes and the hip flexors, or so they say. The main focus of this theory is on humans who sit in a chair all day with their hip flexors in a short position, which leads to adaptive shortening, meaning that that's just how they are now, tight, shrunken, and angry. So if on the way out of a squat, your tight hip flexors are creating tension as you stand up, the glutes are going to register that as a contraction and their effect is going to be muted. Over a long enough period of time, your glutes just forget to show up for work, and the result is what was coined colloquially as gluteal amnesia or dead butt syndrome. Now, this seems like a really nice theory, and there may even be validity to the reasoning, but none of it's conclusive. Off the top of my head, I have to ask a whole bunch of things like, why would the hamstring still fire if they're also a hip extensor? And also, why would the glute be limited in its ability to fire when the tight hip flexors don't really limit the movement until the very top of the extension? 
And why does this tend to happen around the knee where so many people have tight hamstrings, but don't seem to have a problem with their quad shutting off on the way out of a squat or a deadlift? There are plenty of examples of lifters, typically good squatters in Olympic lifting and CrossFit, who develop their glutes and quads to a high degree, but have lagging hamstrings. Are these people also suffering from hamstring amnesia? Also, how do we know it isn't just pure atrophy from lack of exercise, as opposed to the tight hip flexors specifically being tight? And also, also, a lot of high-level power lifters have tight ass hip flexors. I would wager most 900 pound squatters would not do great in a prolonged couch stretch position. These are just questions. It could be that there are solid answers to all of them that I'm just not aware of, but the idea of reciprocal inhibition limiting glute activity isn't as exuberantly passed around today. And I have a feeling questions like this are the reason why. On another front, we can address the use of glutes and the role in movement dysfunction that comes as a result of injury. Even if reciprocal inhibition between the glutes and the hip flexor is dubious, there is still the real fact that people who sustain low back issues have trouble getting back to normal movement patterns even when the injury has subsided. If you've ever pulled something in your back or strained something in your hip, you know how walking with anything that looks like a normal gait is extremely difficult, even with a lot of conscious effort. And even when you're on the mend, you'll find your body guarding against any painful position you could slip into, no matter how much you try to work against it. So there's no doubt that the nervous system will utilize certain protective mechanisms that require more than just simple awareness in order to overcome. The bottom line is that when the body feels pain, it will shut off any movement at the source. Anybody who's had elbow tendinopathy knows intuitively that when you go to bench press, all of the pre-workout and painful middle school memories won't stop the limit to your force production when you feel that knife in your elbow. And you don't get to 95 pounds as part of your warm-up before it just feels like you're being stabbed in the elbow. You might push through, you might get the rep, but you know that you're not executing at 100%. Muscles carry out complex movement patterns with great precision on a second to second basis, and those patterns can be interrupted and changed. We take for granted how complex something as simple as standing is until there is some pain signal that tries to convince us to change the pattern and reminds us of every single time we move wrong. Athletic movements and barbell movements are no different. There are many ways to complete the same movement and they can be affected for the worse. Just like running mechanics aren't evaluated on whether or not you are moving fast or standing still, squatting and deadlifting aren't judged as if you only have the option of standing up or doing nothing at all. Are you looking for access to exclusive programs from the best minds in the field and some of your favorite YouTube influencers? Then look no further than Boost Camp. Boost Camp is a long-term sponsor of this channel, and I wouldn't be partnered with them if they didn't provide a great product. If you want optimal performance, you cannot just wing your weight selection. You have to make deliberate steps forward, so you need a program and you need a way to track progress on it. They make it easy to track your workouts from the convenience of your phone, so you never have to rely on your sloppy handwriting or your bad memory. And they give you access to a library of exclusive programs from some of the most well-known names in the business. Eric Helms, Bryce Lewis, Jeff Schofield, Bald Omni-Man, and yours truly. We all have programs up there that can only be found on the app, and it is absolutely free. My programs, Bull Mastiff and 70s Powerlifter, are both up there. And you can also check out Full Sturker, which tells you how to get strongman jacked using the things you find in a corporate gym. So special thank you to Boost Camp for making this channel possible. Unburden yourself from the hard business of making the perfect program from scratch. We've got them pre-made for you. Download their app right now by clicking the link in the description. But there is a question of how much you can change the use of musculature within the context of one specific movement. The answer seems like it would be pretty important for predicting how much we can increase performance or squeeze out more growth from a specific movement. For instance, if you are straining under a bench press, can you just push hard and that's it? Are the chest and triceps just on or off? If you ask any bodybuilder or powerlifter, the answer is of course not. There are a whole bunch of different cues that range from actively squeezing the muscle during the eccentric, to changing the tempo, to trying to push your hands closer together, to trying to spread the bar apart, to trying to twist your hands to break the bar. And all of these will change exactly how activation happens and the effect on performance and growth that occurs. Consider doing a bench press with lightweight for a few reps under a three second tempo, just going up and down without thinking about the movement and what happened. Then repeat it while trying to squeeze your triceps as hard as you can during the descent and at lockout. 
there will be a lot more tricep activation. You'll feel it. Now, this is where we're in mind muscle territory as opposed to technical activation territory. It's not that the triceps were shut off and you had to condition yourself to bring them back on. You began with a certain amount of control and you are just now using them more deliberately. So at the very least, there is a potential range of use any muscle can have during any given movement, even if it's limited. Now, if you were to reproduce the experiment trying to squat down, you would think that you would be able to execute the same amount of control with your glutes that you would with your triceps. Many of you are going to be devastated to find out that you can't. As soon as your hips break, most of you will feel the muscle lengthen and any voluntary tension in the glutes is going to be cut off. This shows that there is in fact more to lifting than just pushing hard. It's not that you have to do this when you squat or that it's inherently better. It's not that mastering gluteal contraction is something that every lifter must do before putting more weight on the bar. But it does show that there is a level of control that you can demonstrate that may be hidden from you if you don't pay attention. Most can certainly get stronger thinking stand up on a squat or a deadlift, but there is an assumption that those facing specific problems or those pushing the boundaries of human achievement might need more. There may be a scenario where following a cue or growing a weak point requires that that hidden control be expressed. I found the best use case for glute activation for power lifters to be in deadlifts, where the hamstrings contribute a lot to the initial pull up to the knee, but where the glutes have to be cocked, locked, and ready to rock to finish off with a strong lockout. There is a brand of deadlifter, many of them high level, who can pull exceptional weight beyond their knee with astonishing speed, only to miss the lift several inches from lockout, where mechanically they're in the absolute strongest position and where that should be the least of their problems. This is universally considered a glute problem, whether it's the patterning of the hips, the strength of the glutes, or even if it's the upper back putting you in a poor position, which makes the job harder for the glutes. Now we can't just stop there. A problem with the glutes could mean several things. Is it simple awareness that there is an obvious method of executing the lockout that the lifter is not aware of or following through on? For instance, if you're focused on continuing to pull up, instead of pushing the hips forward, that represents a less efficient use of the glutes to extend the hips and might be the difference between a forceful lockout or a missed lift. And it's yet again, another obvious example of how there is more to diagnosing lifting issues by saying, oh, well, he's standing up, so the glutes must be on. Or is it that the glutes legitimately just aren't strong or developed? And then there's a question if any of this has anything to do with chronic dead ass from tight hip flexors. Does a powerlifter who can pull 900 pounds but who has proportionately underdeveloped glutes and a horrendously weak lockout qualify as having gluteal amnesia? That's a hard question to answer, but I'm not sure it really matters because the fix, whether it's a bit of cueing or in-depth proprioceptive work, seems to fall to glute activation work either way. To me, it seems that recommendations are on a spectrum where they are both talking about increasing coordination and recruitment, and therefore more weight and more growth. Mind muscle exists at one end of the spectrum when you already have control over the muscle and you can turn the intensity up or down at will. You can respond when your coach yells hips into your ear. You can tense, pause, and squeeze in order to cook your glutes on the last rep of hip thrusters. On the other hand, models oriented to fixing movement dysfunction or eliminating back pain seem to suggest more deeply ingrained limitations to your neural drive as being the culprit that is causing your problems. Whether these models are the answer or whether they need revising, I'm not sure, but I'm also not sure how much it matters because to a struggling lifter or recovering patient, they both require understanding and exercises that facilitate that activation. If you are a lifter who has underdeveloped glutes or who struggles at key parts of the movement where the glutes are vital, the first step is figuring out what the hell they do and understanding how that contributes to the movement. And it is shocking how many people don't have that. Proprioception is the key here. You have to feel them work and you can do that by doing things like pumping them up, getting some blood in them so you can feel them work during the movement. Back to the tricep example, I've literally done this with band pull downs to help people understand how their triceps operate so they can engage better during a heavy bench press. This also goes for people that are struggling with hypertrophy. Many stellar glute exercises might fail to produce results if the lifter loses a connection to the movement once weight starts to get heavy. Progressing weight is extremely important, but heavier reps also very often take the lifter out of the movement and you start defaulting to worse patterns that don't grow the target muscle quite as well. This is just universally accepted to be true among bodybuilders. I have no idea why it would be different for power lifters or people focused on athletic endeavors. Even something like a barbell hip thrust, which should directly target the glutes, can bring the hamstrings and lower back into the movement. 
When the lifter is just concerned with moving the barbell and slapping more plates on, you're not solving the problem, you're adding to it. So it starts with a basic amount of coordination and the amount you need depends on how long it takes you to get a good result. Here's the thing, if you're a Mike Isretel or a Brett Contreras and your typical training recommendations involve numerous delectable cake building exercises that load, stretch, and strain the glutes directly, that is your glute activation work. As you develop a more powerful and protruding posterior, no doubt you will have a greater sense of awareness that should transfer over to more complex movement patterns like deadlifting, running, and jumping. In that way, I lump generic hypertrophic glute work into the glute activation camp because it's a solution to a similar problem, providing greater contribution to a lift or movement by growing, strengthening, and recruiting a muscle that has room to offer more. Whether it comes because the lifter athlete isn't coordinated and doesn't know what the glutes do, whether it comes from fixing a deeper problem with neural drive and gluteal amnesia, or whether it's just because the glutes could be bigger and stronger and these techniques might expedite that process. Functionally, it's all the same as far as I'm concerned. If you squat and deadlift and your lockout power is on point and your glutes seem to be pulling their weight at key moments of the lift, carry on. If not, you might need to do more through having your coach scream the same cue into your ear as you lock out each rep, through doing glute specific exercises like hip thrusts, or by doing some light proprioception work that alerts you to where those muscles are, what they do, and how they can better contribute to your barbell lifts or the glute accessory exercises that are supposed to grow the glutes to begin with. So that's all I got for today, guys. Thanks so much for watching. Let me know what you think. Have you used any of this stuff with success? Has it helped with back pain? Have you become a better Olympian by doing these? Have your lifts gone up? Or are you in the camp that things just get under the bar, add weight, and you'll be fine? Let me know what you think in the comments. Better yet, take it to Patreon. That is where I update my training. That's where I respond to messages on a weekly basis. The best way to get in contact with me. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Till next time, this is Bromley. I'll see you.